Oh, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show. I, of course, am Mr. Warren Hayes. We're going to be talking about pro wrestling here on this pro wrestling oriented podcast. We're going to be doing this for a while here, right here on youtube.com slash Mr. Warren Hayes. We're on your favorite podcast application, wherever you decide to watch or listen to the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me a chance, letting me entertain, regale you with thoughts and criticisms and reviews about pro wrestling. We're going to be doing a lot of that tonight. But I want to thank you very much. Look, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, consider leaving a like and a subscription. Help score the podcast, but also five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and five-star ratings on Spotify on the audio side of things also help grow the podcast tremendously. So if you want to show a little love, that would be fantastic. And I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. And I, you know, just to show how happy I am, I want to invite you to the Mr. Warren Hayes Show Discord. The link is in the description. Come and join us. We're having, you know, WWE Payback Pickums right now. We have a little contest going on with some Pickums. So uh, uh, if you want to jump in, uh, we got a prize on, at the end of that. The link is in the description. Okay, come and join us. It's a fantastic place to chat pro wrestling regardless. Uh, and, you know, you hang around. You never miss a thing. You never miss anything that I do here as well. If you subscribe, if you follow, if you do all of that good stuff. Because, you know, I do Dynamite reviews on, on Thursdays. Collision reviews on Sundays. I'm a busy guy. I like to talk about pro wrestling and pro wrestling that I like. So this is what we're doing here tonight. We're talking about a lot of stuff. We're going to be doing a review of All In 2023. A preview of Payback 2023. And a short as hell preview of all out 2023 as well i mean i don't know what there is to preview really like we don't even have a full card as when i'm recording this so whatever (laughs) what we'll do our best but in the meantime thank you all for being here let's get to it let's start time for the weekly wrestling inspection Before we get into the crux of the matter, before we we, we start uh, reviewing and previewing stuff, um, we do have to mention uh, that uh, last week we lost uh, we we lost two professional wrestlers, um, uh, r- 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 quite famous and, and, and well known figures, uh, uh, both respectively. Uh, and first and foremost, uh, well, not foremost, but firstly, we uh, had Terry Funk pass away on August 23rd at the age of 79 years old. Uh, If you joined me for uh, the uh, members only broadcast on Friday, uh, I did talk uh, a bit about uh, Terry Funk there as well um, and, uh, and, and how special he is. And I, you know, I think it's important that, that we do underscore just how significant Terry Funk was and is for the business. He was the son of a local, of local wrestling at Texas local, um, wrestling legend Dory Funk Sr., who was also the lead promoter of the Amarillo, Texas Territory, um, and which he, he being Terry, and his brother, Dory Jr., uh, had to run later after his father's death in 1973. Terry was a former, uh, he played, well, he played football in college, but he was always destined uh, to uh, be in pro wrestling. Uh, he would uh, second his brother, again, Dory Jr., particularly when they went over to Japan where they wrestled in a tag team in the old uh, JWA. Um, and in these matches, uh, and you know, just in case, you know, just to make sure that everyone is, 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 is well situated here, the JWA is the old Japanese promotion from which both All Japan and New Japan would be born. Um, and, uh, and in there, just, uh, within that promotion, they would, uh, on top of everything they did there, they would actually have a tag team match with Giant Baba and Antonio Inoki, where they would win the NWA international tag team titles at the time. Um, and the, 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 the Funks would be super loyal to Baba, um, when he left, uh, to found, uh, All Japan in 1972 and, uh, uh, they would work on and off there for the better part of two decades, uh, going on tours uh, just about every time and having a great relationship where at the same time, Baba would send people to work over in the U.S. and even get trained uh, by uh, by the Funks. And here's something, look, here's something I didn't even know. Here's something uh, that I had no idea. Uh, Terry Funk headlined the inaugural 
uh, the inaugural show for All Japan in a tag team match with Bruno San Martino, who was in between WWF title runs at the time, uh, defeating Giant Baba and Thunder Sugiyama, which is absolutely wild to me. Uh, he won the NWA world title in 1975, beating Jack Briscoe. And then from there, I think, you know, I, this is the part where a lot of people become very familiar with him. Uh, he had his tremendous feud, of course, with Dusty Rhodes, the infamous uh, Dusty Rhodes sucks eggs like a dog line in the T-shirt. Worked multiple world tag leagues with Dory as well. They won 10 world tag leagues in all Japan overall. Uh, then joined the WWF for the first time in 1985. And here's what's crazy. Just think about this for a second. He joined the, the WWF in 1985, which would make him in his 40s at this point, which is insane when you think about it. Um, and he'd leave a few, a few years later and uh, you know, continue going back, doing tours of Japan. He also dabbled in acting. You know, I think everyone knows... Uh, about uh, Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone and Roadhouse. I think Roadhouse is probably, uh, I think Roadhouse is probably the most, um, uh, the most memorable uh, one that, um, uh, probably the, mo the, 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 the one that we associate maybe um, the, the easiest with his, with his acting career, right? Um, I, I would assume so anyway. Um, and, uh, let me see here. Yeah, exactly. Um, by the way, we had a question in the chat here saying, what year was San Martino versus, was San, Mar was San Martino and Funk versus uh, Baba and uh, Sugiyama? That was in 72. That was in, uh, in October um, 1972. Um, but, uh, you know, back to the, the timeline in and about itself. Uh, he, um, w uh, so throughout the acting and so on, he still stuck with pro wrestling and then eventually came, you know, Clash of Champions 9, you know, his whole, his whole feud with Ric Flair actually, which I think was a very career defining one for him in North America. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people consider Clash of Champions 9 to be the seminal Terry Funk match. That's the one that um, that is, I, I think it's widely accepted as being the best match he's ever put on. Um, but also, you know, there's the, there's the, um, there's his, the, the match that they had, uh, in, uh, uh, on, um, at the Great American Bash, uh, where the tour, where the two of those dudes, Ric Flair and Funk, they just tore it up. They just tore, tore it up and, and, and and was the and not only was the feud good and not only was it intense and just great because you had two of the absolute best of all time doing it but it was a, a financial success as well uh 12,000 paid at for a gate of 188,000 dollars at the time these are figures just to put it in perspective these are figures that will that would not be topped for WCW until the new world order on pay-per-view, they drew 180,000 buys. Like this was a this was a runaway success for them. Um, yeah, and to think Clash of Champions was on TBS and not on pay-per-view, right? It's just insane on top of it all. Um, so you know, everyone he worked with and all of the in these big uh, in these huge positions, uh, he uh, he absolutely shined. Not only held his own, it was more than that. He shined. He was a contributing factor to all of this. And and it's interesting because the the fruit the feud with Ric Flair and I talked about this on on Friday, but the feud with Ric Flair, and I this is something that I hadn't realized until his passing, uh, and people started talking about it. The feud with Ric Flair is is often considered to be one one of Terry's greats and one of the greats of Ric Flair. But what is the Ric Flair feud that we usually think about that is like okay, well this is one of the greatest of all time. Well, of course it's the series with Ricky Steamboat. Um, but interestingly enough, the Steamboat Flair feud did not draw as well as the Terry Funk, um, as the Terry Funk Ric Flair one. So the, the one that we, in a, you know, in, a, in our modern times with our nostalgia glasses on and thinking back, you know, we all, we think back at the greatness of the matches that Ric Flair and Steamboat had, but at the time, not that they were doing poor business, but they weren't generating outstanding business 
elsewhere. Um, they, they, they weren't generating business, period. Uh, whereas Funk and Flair uh, was just balls to the wall out of control here. Then, of course, he worked in FMW, Frontier, uh, over there. Uh, and uh, he, he, you know, he had his dream match with Onita in, on uh, May 5th, 1993 at the Kawasaki Stadium. Of course, it was the infamous no ropes, barbed wire, time bomb death match. That was a that was the uh, that was the anniversary match. That was on the fourth anniversary of the promotion, um, and uh, so you know that also opened up Terry Funk uh, to the more hardcore style of wrestling, uh, where of course afterwards or during that period actually he joined up with ECW where he was instrumental, um, and uh, you know he'd. Uh, he was in there with a, you know, have a feud with, a, with with Mick Foley throughout all of that as well. Cactus Jack, which he, which he crossed promotions in, right? Because this, it, it was, you know, he had he was feuding with Cactus Jack over in IWA Japan, and then it, he'd carry it over into ECW as well. So it would really be like a tra- transcontinental, you know, a, 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 you know, borderless feud that he had with uh, with Jack at the time. And, and of course, he was extremely, uh, extremely um, influential with, um, for ECW. You know, Paul Heyman, uh, in his uh, pre-match speech before the Barely Legal pay-per-view, took the time to thank Terry. He was always very uh, thankful for the credibility that Terry Funk brought to ECW. And he said, look, this is the quote from the, from the, 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 the pre-pay-per-view speech that Paul Heyman was giving the boys. I would like to thank Terry Funk for all he's done for this company, for help helping us put, uh, for helping putting us on the map, for being unselfish in selfish times, for taking the young guys and showing them a better way. That is, that's just a testament of who the guy was at the same time. Um, he had another run in WCW in 1994. He had the stud stable with Bunkhouse Buck. And then, of course, I think a lot of, more modern fans remember the Chainsaw Charlie stuff in 1997 uh, in the uh, in the WWF. Um, look, I mean, look, there, you know, I've I've read quite a few, uh, read obituaries, listened to obituaries. A lot of the information that I I pulled out here, uh, I took from John Pollock's outstanding obituary that he wrote over on Post Wrestling for um, for Terry Funk, like just an outstanding article that covers so much territory and you still feel by even though it's detailed and rich and there's so many things happening that there's so many things that are that haven't been covered or don't that we haven't talked about that we're forgetting because his career was so expansive there's so many things that terry funk was about like for instance here's the thing in japan right in the 80s right we're talking like the heyday of the crush gals back then you know the the in at the time you know the the women and uh, the Japanese women's wrestling wasn't necessarily considered very seriously by wrestling promoters or even the boys. You know, they were sort of like, mm, eh, you're putting this on for 14 year old girls. <laughs> but but uh, but Terry Funk, you know, he was a proponent of women's wrestling. He believed that a lot of them were better than the guys, than a lot of what what they were doing was actually better than what they were doing. And by the way, Bruiser Brody was of the same opinion as well. So, they, you know, they, they wouldn't ignore, Terry Funk wouldn't ignore what was going on there. He recognized the talent and recognized that this was something special. He was also, also a big fan of Lucha Libre. And to a degree, this is, you know, this kind of openness, this open-mindedness that he had in regards to wrestling and different styles and what's going on is probably the reason why he was able to have the enduring career that he had going into uh, going into the 2000s where his body is hanging fr- by a thread his you know his his knees are dust his ankles are dust his back is shot it, like this is a guy who's when you know when you talk about giving your body to pro wrestling this is what Terry Funk did but he did it in a way where he remained relevant 
decade after decade after decade. We talk about Chris Jericho being the king of reinvention. Well, Terry Funk was probably the uh, was probably the, the 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 pattern that Jericho was 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 looking at was looking at. Because Funk would look at what is getting me over, what what is getting people over. First of all, in 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 this part of the world, in this in this uh, era, what what are we doing here? And then he would adapt and. Uh, he would adapt and uh, and do things to get himself over. He just followed trends, what people were into. You know, Terry Funk was not necessarily a deathmatch hardcore wrestler until he started doing things in FMW. And Terry Funk never did a moonsault until he got to ECW, where he was in his 50s at that point. So there's a lot, there, there's so much stuff in regards to the to, to the career and the legacy of, of Terry Funk, a guy that, that you will never hear anyone tell a bad story about. Like, I have never heard anyone or read in any of the autobiographies, any of the books, well, Terry Funk was a bit of an asshole here to me. Terry Funk was a bit of a, was a, bit of a dick. I, I get the impression that if anyone were to tell me, well, you know, I met Terry Funk one time and he was kind of an asshole to me. Well, that's probably a reflection of you, uh, on you, pal. <laughs> because from all accounts, just a, 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 a kind, generous man and who gave so much to the fans. And, you know, the, the, you know, the term goat gets thrown out around quite a bit, quite a lot, actually. And, um, uh, you know, Maybe a little, uh, you know, uh, um, a little cheekily sometimes. Sometimes I feel a little seriously. It, Terry Funk is an absolute true to form, 100% greatest of all time. There will most likely never be another Terry Funk. There will never be a guy who will be able to combine that, uh, that they'll be able to combine that, uh, that level of, of unpredictability, of, uh, of authenticity, and, and, and pure talent that he was able to convey for 60 years. And, and amazing, uh, just an outstanding career. I mean, look, he was still wrestling in 2017, right? Still, He'd still take a date here and there. Anyway, rest in peace to one of the legends that is without question. And then shockingly, we found out that uh, that Wyndham Rotunda, aka Bray Wyatt, passed away uh, very unexpectedly uh, as the result of a heart attack. Um, and he was 36 years old when this happened. Just absolutely insane. A heart attack after being... Uh, uh, he, it was the result of a heart attack after being away from action due to heart issues that were... Affected due to a bout with COVID-19. So, um, Rotunda himself was born into a professional wrestling family, not unlike Terry Funk. Uh, he, uh, he arrived on, uh, on May 23rd, 1987. He was the son of Mike Rotunda, who was the grandson of Bob Blackjack Mulligan. Of course, Mike Rotunda, IRS, or um, uh, Michael Wall Street, depending on your your era and your references. And um, he's also, uh, he's also, uh, um, he, so uh, he's also nephew to uh, Barry and Kendall Wind, uh, Wyndham as well. He uh, wrestled um, on the amateur circuit in at uh, Hernando High School as a heavyweight where he became state champion in 2005. He also played football as a defensive tackle and guard. Uh, in college, he played a little more football, majored in broadcast journalism, but he wanted to be a pro wrestler. And uh, he just jumped right into uh, WWE's de developmental circuit, joining uh, Florida Championship Wrestling in 2009, which of course was the pre-NXT. Uh, and he would uh, team up with his uh, brother, Bo Dallas, at that time. He was a part of the second season of NXT as the unfortunately named Husky Harris. It was a season that also included people like T T Titus O'Neil, Curtis Axel, Alex Riley, and Low Key. Well, I remember that. 
Uh, then, you know, there was the whole Nexus thing until it was buried under the sun by John Cena. So he had a, he had a taste of, uh, of the main roster, but was sent back to FCW. And that's where Bray Wyatt was born. You know, the, uh, uh, the cult leader, the swamp cult leader, Cape Fear, Waylon Mercy. He had the family with Eric Rowan and Luke Harper, the spooky masks and all that stuff. And he went back to the main roster in 2013 where he was a little hit and miss at first um, until arguably uh, his feud, or should I say the, the the Wyatt family's feud with the Shield sort of solidified their, uh, their position uh, in uh, 2014. He wrestled and feuded with John Cena, had a, uh, had a post-broken streak WrestleMania match with Undertaker, which a lot of people figured that this would be a passing of the torch kind of thing. Uh, and he also feuded with Randy Orton, which... Uh, concluded with his first, well, not necessarily con concluded because they'd revisit the feud later, but that stretch of the feud would include his first WWE Championship victory. This is in 2017. After uh, teaming with Matt Hardy, uh, he took a break, only to return with the Firefly Funhouse and The Fiend, which is arguably what is uh, what he'll probably be most remembered for. He would win the Universal title as The Fiend off of Seth Rollins in Saudi Arabia a few weeks after their dreadful 2019 Hell in a Cell match. Uh, but he then would drop the title, the Universal title, back to Goldberg again in Saudi Arabia in 2020. He'd win it again from Braun Strowman at SummerSlam that year, but then would drop it a week later to Roman Reigns. So a lot of back and forth on that front. And then the Firefly Funhouse match at WrestleMania 36 um uh, was uh was of course a, a a big turning point for his fans for WWE fans it's a match that a lot of people will remember I'll remember it for a long long time and um after that you know things started to take a little turn it feels like after this he was crippled with really bad creative and he eventually was released from the company in 2021 in a move that shocked WWE fans wrestling fans but was rehired in 2022 when w when Triple H was briefly back in control of everything. When I say back, I mean initially, like just in control of everything. He returned in 2022 with a viral campaign. I got people really excited with the with the uh, the QR codes and all that stuff. And he had one televised match after that return. One taped match. He did work house shows and whatnot, but he uh, he had the pit the pitch black match at Royal Rumble 2023, only to be mysteriously pulled from WrestleMania. And uh, and I guess we all kind of know why now uh, his health really uh, took a beating. Bray's work in pro wrestling will always be remembered for his creativity before anything that he ever did in ring. Uh, that was his allure, his creativity, his crowd connection, his, his personality, his performances, and just a charisma that connected with with the audience and created a special bond and um made uh made the you know the the cult leader swamp gimmick thing just work naturally because he had all the attributes to make it work by all accounts a lovely person generous human being he leaves behind his wife jojo and his four children of course our condolences uh go out to all of them and uh and to friends and family who are mourning his loss tragic is the only way you can put this but uh his memory will live on with uh with wwe fans uh for a very very long time he left his imprint may he rest in peace and now it is time to get to it Warren, it's time to start reviewing AEW All In 2023. That happened on August 27, 2023, in London, England, at Wembley Stadium. Now, the official, the official count that Tony Khan decided to to advertise very, very clearly as paid <laughs> right because there's there's a lot of discourse there's a lot of stuff going on 
But what he said very, very clearly, paid, was 81,035 people in attendance that paid for a ticket. WrestleTix, they have distributed 83,199. I've heard people even say it goes up to 90,000 when you start doing the WWE way to count things. <laughs> like it could be any type of number at that point. But, uh, you know, I will appreciate if this is indeed the thing because this is going to be scrutinized and it should be. It should be. Because if we're about to to dive in here and say this is the the, the biggest paid attended the, 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 the biggest paid attendance show in pro wrestling history, which is what we mean when we talk about it being the biggest pro wrestling show in history. Uh, we got to get our facts straight because we don't want to, we don't want to get worked. We don't want to get goobered here. So if it is 81,035, that is a tremendous number. I mean, that is insane. It, it, losing my mind here, how huge this is. Just a tremendous, tremendous And yes, you know, there have been uh, there there have been bigger shows. Collision in Korea, of course, but Collision in Korea you can never really count that because there's no no one bought a ticket for that show. It's not the same. We're not talking about the same thing at all here, and we know the circumstances. And anyone who wants to stick up for dictatorships in this circumstance are more than welcome to do so. Eighty-one thousand. 35. Crazy. Crazy for all the reasons that we've been talking about for weeks. Promotion that's barely, it hasn't even hit the five-year mark and is filling out stadiums like this, putting on international shows. That's huge. Tony Khan at the presser said himself, this was the largest paid attendance in pro wrestling history and added that the full number of people inside the stadium was around 90,000 with comps, staff, hospitality, so on and so forth. I'm, I'm okay going back to an era where we get, hey, you know what? The inflated number is this, but the number of people who paid is this. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm fine with this. You want a few more? Do you want we talk a little bit about the press conference? The, the, not the press conference, but the post match, uh, the post show presser says uh, all year, next year, I should say all year, next year, next year, all in is going back to Wembley. I believe they, uh, they announced the date already, right? August 24, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which is exciting, which is, uh, which is great. You know what? Uh, I think it's awesome. That uh, that AEW wants to go back and give UK fans uh, big time Major League Pro Wrestling. There is an audience there, and we're talking. When I'm saying, you know, UK fans, fans across Europe, you know, people from the European Union who crossed international waters to head to the UK. Um, there were a lot of people from around uh, from around Europe who might who uh, did the uh, who did the trek over to England, hell, I would have, I would have went to this, I would have, I would have jumped in here, got to Wembley to watch this show, um, so, you know, they obviously want to do it again, make it another big deal, is it going to become a regular thing on the AEW pay-per-view circuit, time will tell, but we're doing it again next year, but already, I can tell you this, um, we're not getting this uh, a number even close to this if we don't book matches in advance things will have to be put together better because listen because the magic of your first time in a venue and filling it up first time in a venue in an, in 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 in, 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 a, in a market your first time there is going to generate attention it's going to generate excitement very naturally but that does not mean that is not a guarantee of success for the next time, right? You can argue WrestleMania does that, Warren. 
They don't even announce a single match. And, you know, the show is, you know, they sell out the pre-sales and it's all insane and these crazy ticket prices. WrestleMania is a brand that has been in existence since the 1980s. Now, let's pump the brakes a little bit and it has been very well managed. We're not going to sit here and pretend that AEW All In, a year after the first one, is a name brand that people are going to, you know, go crazy over and swoon over. Now, next year, and I'm not saying that they're going to do 20,000, they're going to do a decent amount. They're going to do, but if they want to get close or improve or break the records that happened this year, they're going to have to build an entirely different card than what they presented here. And I would even go as far as to say, just put on some cool matches, Tony. Just have people, have people come in and do cool matches without a build that you don't need a build for. Uh, dream matches, cool matches, folks that you never thought you'd see wrestle. Just plop a couple of those in there and let it happen. I think that's a that's a formula for success. You know, I didn't need Brian Danielson and Kazuchika Okada, you know, feuding over, well, you know, feuding over bullshit you know my usual example is when I was talking about it when we were going into Forbidden Door I didn't need a feud where Daniel Bryan stole Okada's Rainmaker jacket and Okada was like I've got to get it back or we didn't have Kazu kidnap Brie and then Dan Bryan Danielson's he's tearing my family apart he's getting my fa like we it's just too too Mega stars of pro wrestling having a cool match, and that was more than enough. Anyway, during the show, we saw Mercedes Monet. She showed they put her up uh, during the pre show, she popped up uh, one or two other times, I believe, during the main show, just sitting in the audience, enjoying herself. A lot of people lost their minds over that. I was. I was surprised to a degree. I'll tell you what surprised me is the way they used her. Just sitting there chilling out. Because we all know. Well, when I say we all know. Um, it wasn't a question of if Mercedes Monet was going to work with AEW. It was just a question of when. Like if we're being completely transparent with each other. She was going to do it regardless. It was going to happen at some point. So... She showed up there, and at the scrum, Tony Khan said that, um, you know, a lot of potentials, a lot of potential potential things could happen there. This is his, this is his quote. <clears throat> a lot of potential things could happen there, and I know New Japan Pro Wrestling has had great experiences working with her. I thought it would be great, given that she's not cleared, but wants to take in the biggest paid pro wrestling crowd of all time and see what AEW is all about. So there is a guest. He could be kayfabe too. A lot of people kayfabe at the scrum. She said, I, he, he said, I thought it would be good for her to be here, but obviously she's not wrestling or cleared or doing anything anytime soon. But uh, look, I mean, he's playing it down. But I would assume that you would not put her on your television, on your programming, if next week she's jumping back to WWE, you know what I mean? Tony also talked about uh, streaming opportunities. He said there are multiple different models for a company to deliver their pay-per-view events or premium live events or whatever you want to call them uh, through a streaming network. I really hate the fact that Tony Khan said premium live events. We've been, this is Tony again talking, we've been, we've been talking a lot and having great conversations with the top executives at Warner Bros. Discovery. There's been a lot of interest since the merger in AEW. <clears throat> when the top Discovery executives came in as our new bosses, it was a really exciting day and they've paid more attention to AEW than we have seen really since the very first year. I've had a lot of great conversations with the people at Max about what we can do in the future, not only for the home of these top AEW events, shows like All In, the biggest night in the history of pro wrestling, and our shows we've been doing for years, like All Out, Double or Nothing, Full Gear Revolution, and now Forbidden Door. So we're still working towards that. I think, 
I would like to know why Max the the trigger wasn't put on that wasn't pulled on streaming on Max until you know last minute. I mean, the re I'm still convinced that the reason why we got there we didn't get any precise messaging as to whether where we could watch we I mean us in North America not buying a ticket to be at Wembley Stadium. Um. I still believe that the reason that it took so long for AEW to announce where the pay-per-view could be streamed or All In could be streamed was because they were trying to work something out with Max and somehow, for some reason, it didn't work out. And a lot of people thought it was because, oh, well, they're, you know, they're, they haven't started streaming live events yet. Maybe this was the first one. This was my theory. They maybe wanted to try this out with AEW to begin with, and Tony Khan was like, nah, uh, we're, you're not using, you're not using my show. You're not using my show as a, uh, uh, as a, 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 as your guinea pig. I don't want wrestling fans up my butt. But because we know now that Max has the capabilities, they're going to be, they're going to be streaming um, MLB in, uh, in a couple of weeks in October, right? So, so that's still in the works. It's still going to be a, a point of discussion. We'll see how all that shakes out. He also announced that he is going to be, that AEW is going to be holding a, a, another pay-per-view, a show called Wrestle Dream, October 1st in Seattle. And he, Tony Khan, said that this would be a tribute to Antonio Inoki. Which is October 1st, which is the anniversary of Inoki's passing. So I find this very interesting, but I'm a little guarded at the same time. Is this going to be like a Forbidden Door 2 type of situation? There's, you have to bring in talent from elsewhere, right? Like you can't run an Inoki show and not have people from at the very least New Japan coming in. And I'm, I would assume as well that this has been cleared with New Japan as well. Putting on a grand, you know, pay-per-view tribute to Inoki when New Japan didn't even do that really. You know, the uh, last year's Wrestle Kingdom was, you know, was the 50th anniversary, but it also turned out that, they, you know, they they dedicated it to Inoki, but not even New Japan did a, and you know, an Antonio Inoki. Anyway, look. And in regards to the pay-per-view buys for All In, he says the pay-per-view is tremendous. It's going to be our biggest pay-per-view in well over a year and one of our biggest of all time. It's up there with our biggest pay-per-views and that's really exciting. Probably going to get a little more of that in the Observer this week. And where do we talk about the Observer on the Mr. Weir and His Show universe? On Going Broadway, which is the members-only show that happens every Friday. It's a live stream for members only. Become a member of the Mr. Warren Hay Show channel on YouTube, and I will gladly, and you will you will also be a part of that. I'll gladly cue you in. So let's get to the show. I'm gonna talk about the show itself now. Now, I do this, I review pay-per-views as part of you know the the complete analytical package that is Warren Hayes. The best D-list podcaster with the A-plus audience. I do this frequently. And I get, sometimes I'm excited to talk about a show. And sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm excited for the wrong reasons too. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I can't wait to bury this show, Halloween Havoc 2022. But here today, listen, this, I'll tell you what my feeling is. I'll tell you what my... Let's set the table here. This is the this is the old this is the arc that we'll be operating under for this show here. I am here to talk about a great pro wrestling event and its main event. And we might as well start there, right? We might as well just kick off talking about the main event, which which for me 
lives in its very own little cosm it's its own little its own little environment its ecosystem separate from the rest of what happened not unlike a not unlike a biosphere where things happen there well you know everything else happens around it outside of it and you're we're talking of course we're talking about MJF successfully retaining the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. It's not heavyweight. There's no weight classes. Against Adam Cole. And this is, look, there's a fair reason. There's a fair chance that you're here rubbing your hands together and going, oh, Warren is going to destroy this. Warren's going to destroy, he's going to bury that shit. He's going to go all, he's going to go all Triple H on this. He must have hated this. Like, if you're welcome, if this is the first time you're here, because we did get a, a bunch of new subscribers on YouTube over the past few weeks, and I'm thrilled to have all of the, these new eyeballs. And if you're here for the first time, welcome. And if it's the first time you're listening to me, well, I usually hate this kind of sports entertainment bullshit. I really do. And frankly, look, I was mad when that show finished. And you can ask Kristen. I was mad. Mad as hell. I was so pissed off. I'm telling you. I talk about this often too. I am so glad I don't do post shows anymore. Or instant reactions. Because, you know, I have, I, I you know, I, over the years I've been doing, you know, the, whatever the fuck I do here. I, uh, I, I, I've grown into um, I've grown into a, a spot where I prefer to have um, I, I prefer to have the, the 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 luxury of taking a step back and thinking about stuff of going to sleep on something. I've talked about how I feel, you know, reaction culture, you know. Uh, through Twitter and everything, you know, how, how hot take culture, there we go, has poisoned everything and um, has just poisoned everything where you have to have a hot take. Yeah, but we don't have any more space for thoughts, <laughs> you know, well thought out, put together, argumentative, like reaction. It's not always about reactions. It can be about, hang on, let me assimilate this and think about it for a second. The reaction of what you feel is important. Because look, I went to bed, I slept on it, and I slept on this. My final thoughts on Sunday evening were, I'll see if I'm still mad at this tomorrow, right? And I wake up the next morning, and I was still mad. So on that point, I'm like, okay, so this main event angered me it pissed me off now the wonder i what i wanted to figure out is why and i think i figured it out because i still feel angry about it but i'm not going to sit here and rage i'm not going to throw tables around i'm not going to toss my hat i'm not going to pour water over me although it's getting really hot in here to feel nice i feel that i have clarity i have balance here and we're going to walk through it here. Because this is ultimately what I think about this paper, about this main event. Okay? Hey, Fretz, nice to see you. Welcome. This main event, the main event of All In 2023 in London at Wembley Stadium is a seminal pay-per-view in the history of AEW people. It is one of the most important main events that they've put on and it's not because of the five-star classic work rate match it's not because of the intensity of the performers but because of style because this was a style of main event that had not yet been worked in the main event of an all elite wrestling show this is a style of match that we are 
privy to in WWE. So again, I want to underscore the main event part of this. This is why it's important because this was not a mid card match. It wasn't a curtain jerker. wasn't an up card. It wasn't an upper mid card second from the top match. This was the main event, a main event that was exclusively about story and where the match, the wrestling becomes secondary, where the match becomes an accessory to the story, a match where the AEW title is a prop in order to tell a story. I oftentimes talk to you about how I, and I use the word myself. It's not a poison. It's not a poison pill word for me. In ring stories, stories. I like stories, and I like how stories are developed in wrestling. I like how I like how much you can believe in ring stories when two wrestlers get together and tell you the tale of a confrontation of a fight. That is that to me is what pro wrestling storytelling is and should be. Whatever angles. And feuds, that's why they have other names. Feuds and angles. Whatever gets us is fine. But the story always happens in the ring with physicality, with uh, athleticism, acrobatics. Add whatever type of athletic endeavor you want in there. But that's how, you're, that's how I have always consumed pro wrestling. That has always been my, 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 my preference. And that's what I was looking forward to here. But what we got in the match was the opposite. And for lack of a better term, to, to, to explain to you how I feel about this match, for lack of a better term, I'm going to use a term that I typically reserve for main events for another company. This match was community theater. And the fact that AEW has decided that this that they were going to be okay with this, with this style of main event, is significant. And this is why I am calling this a seminal main event in the history of AEW. Because we are, when I say we, I mean AEW are okay with this style of main event. It is significant and it could be, it's significant because it could be a turning point into how AEW is presented and ergo consumed by wrestling fans. Now, I am going to make this point clear once again. You know, I, I'm just taking, taking my precautions here to make sure, because again, there's been an influx of a lot of new people recently. It's nice to see you and welcome. I'm thrilled to have you here. But I just, so, you know, just to make sure that everyone's up to speed. I have never been more disconnected with the overall WWE product than I have been in the past 18 months to two years at this point. Hard to pin down. I don't quite remember. I don't know what they do over there on a weekly basis. But to me, it's a show about pro wrestling and not a pro wrestling show. I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to do a bit here. I think you understand the nuance. I covered WWE here on the show, minimally, reviewing the big shows for WWE, the big shows for NXT, the industry news that involves them. You know, it, they're still the market leader, but that's pretty much it. I, I, there is so much great wrestling out there that resembles what I want, that I look for, and that WWE does not offer me. Why would I spend my weeks? Why would I spend seven hours a week being miserable, watching stuff that doesn't appeal to me, and then come here and be miserable to you? I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair for you as a viewer. And I don't think it's fair for me as a guy who wants to create content, wants to have his little podcast and talk about stuff that he likes. I think that's, I think that's a fair way to approach it. And listen, if anything, <laughs> I, 
I know I still don't like WWE because I was tricked into watching SmackDown last Friday. <laughs> Because I thought we were going to get a tribute show. I thought it was like, we're throwing the format out and we're having wrestlers going out there and doing shit. And, uh, and it turns out it was just all the usual garbage I dislike. So I'm, I'm still confident in saying WWE has not done a, a, a full 360 on me. Not a 360, a 180, because otherwise they'd be... They did a, a, a full 360, actually. They, did a, they haven't done a full 180 yet to prove me wrong. AEW has been my go-to for North American wrestling since it came into being five years ago, four years ago. Oh, we're, going, we're heading towards five, but you know what I mean, in 2019. Because it scratched my itch, gave me the best of North American wrestling presentation with some good pro wrestling matches, you know, the real deal pro wrestling matches that feel good to me, that I'm like, yes, this is what, this is what it should be, this is what it looks like. It's not hampered by, you know, thick layers of creative and endless promos and artificial environments and it's just like this feels good and you can chalk it up to PTSD when I see stuff like MJF and Adam Cole happen because it reminds me of everything I hate about the other company what I what I fled what I have decided to abandon I don't know what to tell you I'm seeing the company that positioned itself as an alternative, now suddenly leaning into what the other guys do, what the market leader does. And why? Well, they have a formula that's working. They have the bloodline. And the bloodline is, objectively speaking, doing fantastic business, ratings, merch, Tickets. And I'm seeing things that made me flee the other place, start to seep in into AEW at the highest points of the card. I see this. I see it for what it is. And for everyone, for everyone who's who were out there back in 2019 shaking their fists, you know, when AEW was coming up and saying, you know, back in 2019, fuck you, Vince, and cheering when Cody smashed the throne. I ask all of you, why are you suddenly okay with this? Are you okay with this? How can you say on one side of your mouth that you love the alternative, but then you turn around and when the alternative starts to show true signs that they are adopting the worst, the worst uh, 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 attributes of the other guys that you have rejected. And on that side of your mouth, you're saying, yeah, this is great. Ah, it's good times, Warren. Don't worry about it. This is, this is what it is. This is how close we are. And you think I'm full. Internally, they're saying, in AEW, this is our bloodline. Make no mistake. They know what they're doing. I recently found out that, oh, they've, they've planned this for months. Down the road. We're not done. They know what they're doing. And I don't know why anyone should be shocked. They bring in oodles of producers and coaches who have all operated television wrestling under the guidance of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. They all came into AW with the, yeah, to help take the load off of t uh, Tony Khan. And we're going to pretend that we don't know where this is coming from, Warren. The, how, is the, how is the WWE style seeping in? That's impossible. And no disrespect to any of these coaches who are there. The guys like Sanjay and Pat Buck were fantastic producers on top of that. The coaches, the producers, the agents, whatever the fuck you want to call them. But I'm seeing the reflexes. I'm seeing 
exactly what I don't like from the other place here. So again, how can you say we hate the bloodline, but then turn around and cheer the main event when we have monologues in ring, we have multiple ref bumps and interferences. This is a pattern. This is a pattern of main event WWE matches that feature the bloodline. I cannot but not be consistent here and tell you what I'm observing on one side and I don't like, I'm observing here and I don't like it either. Even though these are all wrestlers I like. All wrestlers whose, whose work I enjoy. I love MJF. I love Adam Cole. I even love Roman. I think they're all tremendous in what they do. Top stars, world class. But we're going back, we're even throwing back to NXT when we have spots in the middle of the ring where we're going, why am I so violent? Remember those when Johnny, Johnny Gargano would look into his hands? Oh, can I be this violent? We're doing the, we're doing it all. Playing all the hits that work for the other guys. Because I'll tell you what, trying to be WWE light is not going to work because people are going to see right fucking through it. And AEW should concern itself by developing its own identity, its own brand identity outside of let's see what the other guys are doing. Can we try to do the same thing? That is 2005 TNA bullshit. Now I'm going to take a sip because I want to counterbalance this. By the way, Ben, Echo Flair, nice to see you. Welcome. I want to counterbalance this because like I said, I it's like I said, I'm, I slept on it and I think I have clarity and I have balance here. So I don't want to give you the impression that I just have shit to say, but this was visceral. This is why I hate the thing. The only part that I have never liked when it came to the build to the MJF Adam Cole feud are the vignettes. And I am on record and I am consistent. I, I was unable to grow a funny bone because I don't think they're funny. But go back, listen to everything I said Pull up the tape, as they say. The vignettes, bleh. But the post-match interviews, the pre-match interviews, the in-ring the in-ring itself, the post-match promos, all of it is good. I enjoy everything else outside of the vignettes. So it's not even a question of me coming here to tell you, hey, all of this shit stinks. I'm not even on that train. I like it. Do you know why I like it? Because MJF and Adam Cole are stars and have the chops, the charisma, and the talent to pull it off. You'd put, you'd put any, you know, green-bellied, green-navelled rookie from NXT into this type of situation and it would be cringe as hell. But these guys make it work because they're pros. And everything they do outside of the vignettes, I find... Of course, it's always me. It's not about anyone else. It's about me. I find has always been much more successful to making this angle believable and work. They don't need the vignettes, which only, which make me feel uncomfortable because they're not funny. <laughs> so I was looking forward to this main event. And the more we got closer to all in, the more it was like, you know what? This makes a lot of sense. Cause at first I had some reservations like, 
Is this what we're going to do? Is this, is this really? And the more it went on, I was like, yep, this is it. This is what you want to do. And I, unlike a lot of my peers, I am extremely lenient when it comes to buildups with nonsense or, or, or that right stink. If we end up with a match that rules, but folks, we did not get a match that rules. We did we didn't get a match, honestly. If we're being honest, you know, if we're being let let's get into it. But not that much. This wasn't a match. We got dialogues and poses and, uh, and emoting for cameras and double ref bumps and interferences. And, and, and here, after this match, once it's all done, where are we? We're exactly in the same goddamn spot we were as we were coming in. No real story bumps. Nothing was advanced. Again, does this sound familiar to you? Does this... The, what I just explained, what I just walked you through, does that sound familiar to you? We got a champion getting brain busted on steel chairs, wondering, you know, and the guy goes into the ring and he's wondering, oh my God, what have I done? Am I so, how could I be so violent? And then the champion, after the match, throws his title at the guy saying, I don't care about the title. Because your friendship means more to me. And I'm like, okay. If you say so. Champion doesn't care about being the world champion of his company. No triggers were pulled. No great advances were made. And then we end up with a world championship. That the world champion doesn't even care about. Does any of this sound familiar to you? I would not be here talking in this way about this match if we got a match out of it. If we got a great match out of it. And we know we could have gotten a great match out of it because the draw that Cole and MJF had, what was it, in May? Outstanding match. Just... Compelling, exciting, tremendous stuff. MJF is a great pro wrestler. Adam Cole is a great pro wrestler. And the more stuff we get like this, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. The more stuff we get like this and the more it gets over, the more other guys on the roster are going to want to do this to get over. Not unlike Terry Funk. Where he looks at the lay of the land and says, oh, this is what's getting people over? Fine, I'm going to start doing moonsaults too. That's just how it goes. And that, you can't blame any pro wrestler for doing that. That's what they're supposed to do. Get themselves over. You adapt with the audience. You adapt with their reactions. You get yourself over. That's your job as a pro wrestler. And as much as I, as people probably... Maybe some of you are listening and going, well, what a fuddy-duddy this guy is and how much it ruffles my sensibilities here. I also like to think, nonetheless, that I'm a guy who is, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, okay? Because I'm going to bring up this point here. Because this is the one that I still clutch to, that I have faith in, okay? AW Wrestling, from its onset, from regardless, okay? This is the one thing that I'm clasping onto, has always been about providing wrestling for different tastes, this has always been the case. From showcasing PWG style matches to, you know, Cody putting on like old school territory type fights to, to, to brawls, to technical specials, to spot fests, to story driven matches, to the highest level of main event spectaculars, to extraordinary tag team wrestling, to compelling women's wrestling, like something for everyone. This has been... This is, again, something that I have spoken highly of in regards to AEW for a long time. It's all about catering to the largest amount of taste as possible. You might watch an episode of AEW Dynamite and maybe maybe you're turned off by the blood, but then you you get, you know, a crazy trios match with a bunch of lucha. You get the lucha bros in there with Bandito and everyone's fucking flying around and you're like, Christ, this shit rules, right? That's, that's fine. Okay. So you could sit down 
and, 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 and tell me, Warren, this is the way the wind is blowing. This is another type of pro wrestling. So it only makes sense that AEW would dabble into it. I'm like, okay. Okay. I, I'm, I agree. But doesn't this other kind of wrestling fan, this other guy who is already turned on by, you know, this type of match, doesn't this fan already have their playground? Don't they already have their own shows? But hey, listen, look, let's push, let's push the half full glass a little more. Let's keep going down this part. Let's get into the weeds a little bit. I like the idea of having a wrestling story where two grown men, two pro wrestlers are having an angle about the complexities of male relationships, okay? What we expect from male relationships, what we expect from them as men and how difficult it is to have a friendship in a business that is notorious for backstabbing and protecting your spots before anything else and where in kayfabe on top of that, all friendships, all friendships are doomed uh, to be to to are doomed from the start. Someone's going to turn on someone. So, th- I'm not blind to this. I understand it, and I appreciate it. I think it's I think it's cool, but I like my world title matches to be fights. <laughs> you know, your world title should never take backstage to the story because you know then what happens then this is what's eventually going to happen if we keep going down this path you're going to get the well, what's the story people who are going to come drooling all over the place when you have a main event match what's the story the story is the fucking world title but now if the world title doesn't even matter to the champion and he's tossing it aside what am I supposed to lash on to It's not as if AEW hasn't been able to do long-term stories in the past and good stories in the past. Look at Adam Page. Look at Adam Page and his ascension and, and how intertwined it was with Kenny Omega and how wonderful that was. Long-term story. The beats had been planted. And don't forget, don't forget, we, I am here talking to you about sports entertainment creeping into, uh, creeping into the main event And this is a company who had a top heel stable composed of sports entertainers and who referred to themselves as sports entertainers. And to make sure you got the joke and you understood where they were coming from, they even did the, the worldwide leader in sports entertainment. They even did that gimmick to make sure that you clearly understood where they were coming from. Maybe, a, look... But maybe this is what AEW has been trying to do for a while. You know, attract WWE fans, right? Maybe AEW is going to fall into the same trappings as everyone else did before them who tried to, you know, be like the other guys, right? Try to attract the WWE fans, those, those mystical casuals, right? Like WCW tried to do, like TNA tried to do. We all had faith that AEW could learn from this history, but I maybe the allure is too, maybe the allure is too hard to shake. I don't know, like here's the thing. I wanna make something clear, AEW is not doomed, okay? I'm not, you know, preaching at the top of the hill, saying that everything is gonna come crashing down there on the cusp of a huge TV deal, Jesus Christ. They put 81,035 people sold in Wembley Stadium. We've talked about it here before though. When we talk about money, about coming up with a huge deal, huge guaranteed money makes it much less of a stress on a daily basis, on a weekly basis for AEW to put people into buildings. You're not scratching as as much for a hundred more pay per view buys or a thousand more people in the seats, or maybe uh, maybe the other the opposite, right? A hundred more people in the seats and a thousand more buys, right? You're not you're not scrimping and scratching for that. You're like, oh, no, we got we got our billion or so. We're cool, and that can have an effect a complacent effect on what is being promoted because you already have the money. 
So you can relax on a lot of stuff. Guaranteed money, that's what happens. And if you ask me, the combination of main events like this and the loom of uh, the looming guaranteed money doesn't make me feel comfortable. Now I want to I want to officially make this a keystone moment right here of the Mr. Warren Hayes show lore. I am not comfortable seeing main events like we got and then suddenly AEW soon going to have a big fat uh, 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 a big fat uh, 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 guaranteed money contract. I am concerned at how that's going to impact creative. So those are my notes for the main event. Just the main event. We got, we got some community theater that was put on for 80,000 people who ate it up, don't get me wrong. They loved it. I cannot tell you the live crowds ain't killing it. I just wish it was a great wrestling match from two guys who I know are able to do it, which was on a show that was otherwise great. I have so little quibbles for the rest of the show. The rest of the show is tremendous. Just excellent stuff over and over and over. I'm like, when is the, when is the energy going to start ta tapering down? Like, just a great show. Let's talk about the rest then. Well, let's talk about the Zero Hour. The Ring of Honor Tag Team Titles. Look. Adam Cole and MJF beating Ozzy Open is, is, was weird and I should have seen it coming. I was really pushing for something else. I really thought we were going to get a really, some really exciting meat on the bone here. And I think this was just a shame and it should have been a sign that they were going to push harder into this. And I mean, and here's the thing. Why Ozzy Open though? Why Ozzy Open had to be sacrificed in the way they were? Uh, this is a team that despite, you know, if you, if you watch pro wrestling, if you watch pro wrestling outside of, you know, the, the, the major shows, you were already aware of Aussie Open. You knew who, who they were. You knew how fantastic they were. But then now they they're, they're on American television. And I know because there's people on the Discord when you weren't familiar with who Ozzy Open was before they showed up on AEW. And they have to win, Ozzy Open has to win these people over. And now they come in, they, you know, they come into this and they're being mocked or made fun of with the, you know, the stupid Australian references and the Blooming Onions and all that bullshit. And then, just a, a seven minute useless match that, just got the titles on MJF and Adam Cole for some reason. And Ozzy Open just like, Pfft. maybe there'll be a follow-up to this. But I don't think, like if I'm, a, if I'm a fan that is unfamiliar with the work of Mark Davis and Kyle Fletcher, I, I, you're like, I don't, I, well, what's so special about these guys? And I get it. Don't worry, I get it. But it all feels like just slapdash booking. And we got the FTW title match where Hook defeated Jack Perry to regain the title. <sighs> Should we get into it then? Should we do this? I don't see a better opportunity than to do it right now. During early, actually, in the FTW championship match, Jack Perry looked right at the camera because he came in with a in a limo and Perry and Hook fought on the limo around the limo and on, on top of the limo at some point Jack Perry looks dead center in the middle of the camera and he says real glass cry me a river this was a reference to an online report of an issue that existed at a collision taping weeks ago. We're not talking last week. We're not even talking two weeks ago. 
We're talking. I, I think it's like over a month old. Where CM Punk and Jack Perry had a dispute over the usage of real glass in a match. Jack Perry wanted to use real glass. He said he had some vacation time that was setting up and he was, he was like, why don't we do a, a, a glass spot? So I just, and his idea was, I'll do a glass spot, go on my vacation. I'll, so that'll help me. Being off TV will sell the angle, whatever. It had been reported that, it had been initially been reported that Jack Perry wanted to do the glass spot because he wanted to take some time off. And that was mischaracterized because it turns out that the idea was for Jack Perry to, Jack Perry already had the time off and wanted to use the glass spot as a way to justify him being off. But CM Punk said, no, no, no. And a lot of people saw this as CM Punk being, uh, you know, looking out for the young guys, making sure they don't do stupid shit. Okay. So this is what this is. This is what the Crimea River line is about. Okay. That that's that's what this is about here. In case in case you didn't know, in case you were you were blissfully unaware. Now, n now you're in the mud with the rest of us. So, I'm I, okay. This is off of uh, John Pollock over at Post Wrestling. He broke down the events that happened on Sunday after the match when the match was done. It is believed that CM Punk met Jack Perry in the gorilla position and asked Perry if and asked if Perry had something to say and it escalated into shoving with Punk allegedly applying a choke before the two parties were separated Nick Hausman reported that no punches were thrown it was also consistent that Perry amongst all the reporting that was happening that Perry was removed from the building with Punk also leaving but it's been disputed as to whether or not Punk was ordered to leave or that he left out of his own volition Wade Keller at Pro Wrestling Torch and this is all hap this is all yesterday Monday I'm recording this on a Tuesday okay this is all stuff that's appearing like yesterday Wade Keller at the Torch added that Punk allegedly threatened to quit AEW in the heat of the moment and there was even concern of having to change the match order with Punk set to go on with Joe immediately as the first match of the pay-per-view, right? But cooler heads prevailed and Punk worked the match in the scheduled slot. And this is amidst a bunch of reporting, contradictory reporting, essentially around who did what first, who came to who first. This is... This is kind of the thing that was happening Monday and everyone was going, oh my God, oh my God. Now, Brian Alvarez, again yesterday, reported, made it clear that this was not something and made it clear that this was something that he felt was confirmed in a way the specifics of the fight were not. But he reported that both Jack Perry and CM Punk were removed from Wembley Stadium during the all-in show it just wasn't immediate and then later reported that they were both suspended and would likely not work all out weekend because don't forget we've got a pay-per-view this sunday folks and then we found out that nobody came to get cm punk at heathrow airport there was and i know this there, there was a report being thrown around to people from a fan saying CM Punk was in, was in the underground and didn't know where to go because no one came to pick him up at an airport. So he was mad and we had saw pictures and he was mad. Because no one came and picked him up at the airport. Now, 
Woke up this morning. We get a, a report from Sports Illustrated saying that, confirming that both CM Punk and Jack Perry were suspended. Then that report gets unconfirmed by Sean Ross Sapp who said that CM Punk has not been informed of suspension by AEW. But then later, House of Wrestling's Nick Houseman said that CM Punk's lawyers were told that he was suspended. So not CM Punk was told, but the lawyers were told. Folks, lawyers are still involved. Throughout all of this, we don't know what's going on with Jack Perry. But then throughout the day today, okay, and there might be stuff at this point as I'm recording this, there might be new things that have happened that I'm not aware of. And maybe by the time you listen to this, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, maybe there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about that's already moot, all right, in the details. But throughout the day today, it was the story that would not quit because Brian Alvarez popped up on Wrestling Observer Live. He was back. Apparently, he got COVID. He tested positive for COVID. That's a shame. Hope he gets better soon. But here's the here's a, he had a, Brian Alvarez added a lot of stuff here. First of all, and I'm 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 reading this thanks to the extraordinary work of Trevor Dame on Twitter X, uh, who uh, who did live recaps of this. Trevor Dame says, uh, well. Alvarez says, I should say, uh, regarding the punk travel story, Brian confirms that no one was there to pick him up from the UK airport. He had to take a train and get fans to direct him to Wembley. So the reason, don't forget, this isn't necessarily news, but this was, this was slotted out. This was sent out yesterday on a thing that happened a couple of days ago, but this was slotted out, you know, to make people feel bad for CM Punk, right? So he says, Alvarez, he says he heard two stories. In one side, Punk couldn't get a hold of anyone from AEW once he was stranded at the airport. The other side says he did get in touch with people and was given options and he took the train. He, he said, he said. Brian was told Perry walked back after the all-in match as he walked by Punk. Punk said, do you have a problem with me? And Perry replied that, well, you heard what I said out there. Alvarez says that there were a lot of witnesses to the Punk-Perry fight at Gorilla, including Tony Khan. Punk apparently then said, you know I could beat your ass. Then Punk shoved him and put him in the choke and it was broken up immediately. Alvarez says the fight was close enough to Tony Khan in the gorilla position that monitors fell on Tony. Lots of witnesses. Samoa Joe broke up the fight. Punk was immediately angry, threatened to quit, did not want to wrestle. Alvarez says things were delayed 10 minutes because of this I don't want to editorialize just yet. Let's walk through what we what we what we know here. FTR and the Bucks were asked if they could open up the show, and they said they weren't ready. So they asked the Golden Elite Six Man if they could, and they said, "Yeah, I guess we could." Joe Samoa Joe was pissed because he wanted to wrestle at Wembley Stadium. So they got things together, and we got the Punk Joe match first, as we saw. As planned. Brian Alvarez talking about how Miro tweeted out the story that Punk initiating physical contact, that, that Perry initiating physical contact with CM Punk, which was the original report, was bullshit and was now today tweeting nice UK cab, which Alvarez says is an obvious shot at Punk. Now, Alvarez says that there was apparently 
a second near incident. Are you ready for this? Where Punk came back through the curtain where Miro confronted Punk and asked him about what happened with Perry and Perry asked and Punk asked Miro if he had a problem with him now and if he wanted to step outside. Now this is the guy who remember at, at the gripe bomb last year at All Out was sitting with his muffins telling everyone, if you've got a problem with me, come backstage and we'll hash it out. We'll talk about it. And we've got people doing exactly that. And he's like, want to step outside, pal? Alvarez wants people to take note that Punk did not say, I'm not suspended. He said no one contacted him about a, sus a suspension. And that was later, we found out that it was through lawyers. Bra Alvarez also referenced how the elite were kept in the dark on a lot of stuff during their suspension. So basically suggesting that if CM Punk was also being kept fairly in the dark, that wouldn't be out of the norm for AEW. Brian does not know. Brian Alvarez, of course, does not know Ooh, what all of this yeah. means. He says the anti-punk side says you can't go after someone physically because they say something you don't like. The pro CM Punk side says everyone is after him, which is absolutely top-notch, paranoid CM Punk behavior. Alvarez says the Punk situation put a damper on the whole all-in show for a lot of the talent. Alvarez says a friend of Punk's got so mad, he punched a wall and broke his hand, which was later, uh, this was later debunked that this never happened and a lot of people thought it was Brody King. Brody King did get mad apparently, but like kicked the trash can or something, but didn't break his hand punching a wall. And he says morale is down. Alvarez does saying uh, people were waiting for it. Something has to be done. How many times have we said that this year? Something has to be done. Or this year, uh, the past calendar year, the past 365 days. You think that's all? You think we're done? Samoa Joe is out there. Samoa Joe tweets today. Know that there are some people in life who will cherish your friendship and others who will commodify it. Both relationships can work on some level as long as you are treating it the same way. That being said, the latter usually sucks. You know what that says to me? You know what I what that rings into my ears? That says to me that Samoa Joe has had it. Samoa Joe is fed up. If I'm at a point where Samoa Joe is done, I am hitting the bricks. If there's one guy I do not want pissed off, angry, being completely disconnected, it's fucking Samoa Joe. But here's something else on top of it. CM Punk and Samoa Joe, yes, storied rivalry and it's a, friends. Samoa Joe would show up on Collision. Remember when we were talking about Collision? Would be, we'd have a bunch of, CM Punk's contemporaries there to make him happy, right? People that he's worked with, that he trusts. Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, so on and so forth. The FTR. Samoa Joe, man. He's done. And for him to come out and tweet that? Jesus Christ, he has to be fed up. This was a last straw situation for him. And then, to make this all better... As if the as if this wasn't sweet enough a situation, Wade Keller today in the torch had this. When Jack Perry made his unauthorized comments on the pay-per-view about real glass, a reference to story that Perry believed Punk floated to the wrestling media weeks earlier to try and make him look bad, which is 
quite possibly that because don't forget this real glass situation appeared when CM Punk was sort of getting some bad press and then suddenly there's always something good that appears to make him look good well this anyway but since it was you know it was floated around weeks earlier to try and make Jack Perry look bad Punk was already upset about not being picked up at the airport by anyone with AEW Punk didn't know at the time that no one was picked up at the airport, which is apparently a thing. No one, everyone had to arrange for the transportation. And he wasn't singled out or forgotten about. AEW, unlike WWE, didn't provide that level of, of, of logistical travel support to the wrestlers on this overseas trip. Pro Wrestling Torches learn CM Punk confronted Tony Khan in his locker room in what has been characterized as a heated in it as a heated intense manner and at one point according to three sources who have heard about the situation told Khan he quit and chewed out Khan with harsh phrasing now this is what I know as of 9 14 p.m eastern time on a Tuesday night there may be ups and downs to, to this, but I, I think I've covered the timeline and the major story beats here. Now, what are we saying here? What are we talking about? What? I've been hammering this home and I'm not special. I'm not the only guy who's been saying this or gal or non-binary who's been talking about this. CM Punk was going to explode again. And it was not a question. It is never, it has never been a question about when. It's not a question of if, it's a question about when. And there you go, it's happened. Getting into fights, getting into people's face. All this locker room, locker room leader bullshit about not wanting drama backstage. And being the lightning rod. Everyone's out to get me. This is this is classic. Classic. CM Punk paranoia. This is stuff that we have seen. Not just in AEW. Multiple, multiple times. This is a guy who thinks everyone is out to get him. The, this guy has 100% wrestler brain. That people are coming in to take his spot. And he fights back. And he says things. And then does the opposite. And then he feeds his journalist pals, his mouthpieces. You know who they are. If you don't, that's fine. Feeds them his, his sides of the story where he always seems to come across as misunderstood. Poor guy. Again, I'll be lying if I tell you that this wasn't interesting and fascinating. And I love this shit. This is the kind of chaos I love. I love this shit. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's, I think we have reached a level here where Tony Khan has to put his big boy pants on because if he's being chewed out by the talent in heated arguments and he can't keep this guy under control at the biggest fucking show of in all of pro wrestling history. The biggest show in pro wrestling history and minutes before it officially starts, before the main show begins, the one that everyone's bought on pay-per-view, we're having fights at gorilla position. We have monitors tumbling on the boss. We have, we have talent threatening to quit. We have uh, people scrambling to try and replace the opener with another match. It is fucking garbage. That is untenable and unprofessional. And if you think I'm only shouting at CM Punk here, I'm not. There is a man in this company that has to put his pants on. Stop, stop treating this guy like his best friend because he is not his best friend. CM Punk is a dark Cloud, he is a cancer, call him whatever you want. 
but he brings with him this energy, this type of situation. It's just something that follows him everywhere he goes. And at what point, at what moment in time do we look at this and we continue to pity him when this has been a constant in every locker room he's been in? At what point do we do we take a sit back and we look at this and we're like, maybe he's the problem. And maybe it's not everyone else. Because CM Punk right now, he's the Skinner Simpsons meme. Where it's like, no, it's the children who are the problem. That's absolutely what it is. And I've had discussions with people saying, well, you know, there was a time where, you know, there were some people, you know, oh, a lot of people didn't want him in a, from the get-go. And I'm like, who? Who didn't want CM Punk from the get-go in AEW? The Bucks? The Bucks were texting him. The Bucks were texting CM Punk to come to the company before the company was even formed. Colt? Colt Cabana? Sure. I can understand why Colt Cabana didn't want him around. We're going to get into some, We're about to get into some weird-ass revisionist history here because I distinctly recall Everyone being super fucking excited for this. I myself. We have the reservations. We talked about it. Look, CM Punk is CM Punk. But he came in happy. He seemed lighter. He seemed to float. He seemed happy to be back doing what he loves. Talking about working with everyone. And be, and you're like, I'm buying into this. I'm buying this. But you can't. You can't change a tiger's stripes, man. Paranoid, worried. He thinks everyone's out to get him. He thinks everyone is out to get him. And the fact is, the fact is, is that there's a lot of people in this company who don't give a shit. They want to make money. They want to work for, they want to be on TV. They want to do what they love and make gobs of cash in the meantime. And this guy was just about ready to throw a fit and walk out the door, leaving Samoa Joe hanging dry. Samoa Joe, who wanted to work Wembley Stadium, 80 plus thousand people. But no, CM Punk was ready to walk out the door because little old Jack Perry looked into the camera and said an, an unplanned line. Hang on a second. Wait a second. Where? Hmm. Who has hit AEW television and has said an unplanned line before? Hmm. Ah, oh, gee whiz. Gee willikers it's on the tip of my tongue. I feel like, I feel like there's someone in AEW who's done that before. Wait, it's CM Punk. Calling out Hangman Page. When it wasn't on the... It, 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 when it wasn't on the uh, on, uh, 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 on the scorecard, it wasn't on the the, the uh, not the scorecard, the uh, the run sheet, it wasn't planned. Call him out, call him a coward, all because of one line, all because of one line that Hangman Page told him the workers' rights promo. Oh Jesus Christ, that got to him, that got to him so bad. And Jack Perry looking into the camera and saying a line that unless you're really online, you have no idea what he's talking about. But no, that was a too far. That got to him too. He is such a gotten to wrestler. He is paranoid. Paranoid. Oh, yes, it was on TV when he called out Adam Page saying, come out, Adam Page, you're a coward, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It opened up a dynamite. I remember I'm not talking about the recent promo that he did on Hangman Page calling him a peg warmer with his action figures. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one that he did on Dynamite where he completely went against, uh, where he went completely against the script and decided to do that. Him, 
It's fine when he does it. It's chuckles. Oh, you know. We're settling scores. It's jokes. But when other people do it, Moxley was right, by the way. I don't know how tenable this is. I don't know how tenable this is. No, that's all right. Don't worry about it, Jeff. You're good. You're good. You're good. I don't know how. Te- I don't know how tenable this is. But really, something has to be done. Something absolutely, positively, one thousand percent has to be done. And the fact that I heard that lawyers had to receive this information boggles my fucking mind. And Tony Khan might be starstruck as, you know, the, you know, the, the, the message board dork that we all are. I'm including myself in this. Don't get me wrong. I've said it multiple times. Tony Khan is one of us. And he's got CM Punk there. He was able to bring back the Messiah of, of pro wrestling. He has risen. Him. He did it. Tony Khan. Mid-South Tony. Brought him back. He's got to let him go now. Because he's not playing with action figures. He's playing with a lot of fucking money and the livelihood of hundreds of people under him as well. It's enough. We're enough. This, of course, is a developing story. And and listen, I, I preface this and... You know, when we started the stream, I want to make one thing clear. I know there is a lot of people who have CM Punk fatigue, and I do not blame you. I get it, but log off. And I, it's my, it is my sincere hope that you pop off of Twitter, stop watching me for a while, recenter yourself, and come back. If you're fed up with this, because this, this stuff here, this is good shit, pal. I love this stuff. We will always talk about CM Punk and AEW on this show. Because this is news, because this is significant. And as annoying as it may be, and I recognize it as annoying as it is. And regardless of the amounts of fatigue we have, this has repercussions, huge repercussions for the business of AEW. And we have to follow it. We have to keep our eye on it. This podcast will always talk about CM Punk and AEW. Just to let you know, help you making a choice here, if you will. And if you, because I'm being serious. If you unsubscribe, if you unfollow, if I will not even be offended if you're listening to me talk right now and you're like, hey, you know what? I'm so fed up, Warren, of of CM Punk. I can't listen to you anymore. And I'm like, good, that's that's fine. And it's, I'm not even, I'm not offended. It's not even getting me upset. I'm like, good, protect your peace instead of, what's the opposite? Writing angry comments in my YouTube videos, sending me, you know, sending me weird messages. You know, it's like, what's the opposite? I don't want the opposite. Protect your, protect your peace. Because I'm, I'm telling you, the story's moving forward. I'm not done talking about it. But we're talking about a pay-per-view here. So the match, in and about itself with, with, with Hook and, and Jack Perry, I thought was fine. I would say it over-delivered. Because they brawled around the limo. We talked about this a little bit. And, you know, they kicked the shit out of each other. With Perry even landing a rolling thunder from the top of the car onto the to, onto the uh, the hood. And then he was suplexed into the windshield by Hook. Just great stuff. They finish up in the ring with uh, Perry tapping out to the red rum. I still want to say Taz Mission. Good stuff. Good stuff. Over-delivered. I thought it was very good. Um, then we had the opening match that we came so close to not having. 
CM Punk uh, defeating Samoa Joe to retain the real AEW world title. Look, if CM... I, reason number one CM Punk should hit the bricks is because we won't have any more of this interim title, real world title bullshit here. And I'm absolutely cool with that. But for the match itself, despite everything I just talked to you about, everything I just exposed, I really like this match and I liked it a lot. Joe, Samoa Joe, just the coolest guy. Absolute killer, right? And CM Punk thrives in these situations. And he worked hard here. And look, great spot. Joe catches, catches Punk off of, of a Rana, off the apron. And he just swings him through commentary. Fantastic visual. I was like, all right, this is, this is great. Punk blades. Get a good control segment by Joe. CM Punk does the Hogan stuff and the atomic leg drop, but Samoa Joe is the guy who hulks up. No cells hulking up. Listen, and I, I always see this, this conversation. It's like, oh, well, yeah, we hear the CM Punk booze, but we also heard some chants. I don't know if it was 50-50. Listen, if it was 50-50 or if there were more people chanting for CM Punk, he would not be doing the Hogan stuff. That's something he's doing playing to the crowd that is being very vociferous in hating him and booing him and treating him like a heel. And when you see CM Punk coming out smiling and going, you know, mugging, you're going, well, what are you going to do? They hate me. That means he's getting negative reactions from the crowd. They're not 50-50. You're not going like this. No, he's getting negative reactions. Spinning toe hold as a tribute to... Uh, Terry Funk by Punk as well. And he wins with the Pepsi Plunge. I really like the opener. I thought the opener ruled. I thought it was very good. Next match we had was Jay White, Juice Robinson, and Kaneske Takeshita defeating the Golden Elite, Kenny Omega, Adam Page, and Kota Ibushi. And again, I thought this was really good. I thought this was great. From one, from one great match to another. I feel I have to underscore a couple of things here. This is why you're here, right? You want my, you want my thoughts, my analysis? Look, Takeshita, he's fantastic. Nobody runs the ropes like Kaneske Takeshita. He is frightening at how fast he runs the ropes. Nobody does it like him. I thought Hangman Page, star of the match. He was not just the MVP. He was the star of this match. Absolutely fantastic hot tag that he got. Just solid, compelling, high octane, uh, high risk, high impact offense. No conceivable reason can be mustered up, can be conjured from the depths of the deepest abyss to convince me that Adam Page should not be on television more. There is no fucking reason that this guy should not be lighting it up on TV on a regular basis like it had been for months. He's too good. Put him on TV, had him beat, had him, have him beat under guy have them behead people with lariats with buckshot lariats have them you know crush necks with the dead eye i don't care there is no reason for this guy to not be on tv every week on five hours of weekly excuse me yeah five hours that's right of weekly programming there is no reason that this guy should be sitting at home doing nothing. When it comes to Kota Ibushi in this match, I, look, I'm at a point where I don't know about Kota Ibushi anymore. I'm not excited about him anymore. I thought the prospect, the, the prospect of him working in North America... Uh, working with AEW, reuniting with Kenny, doing shit with the Elite. I was into it. I think a lot of us were. And I think it was normal to be into it. I think it made a lot of sense. 
But, you know, the, the, the GCW stuff that he did at, over WrestleMania weekend was passable where you're like, well, listen, couple of weird contexts. Uh, he hadn't wrestled in a while. A little rusty. Let, 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 you know, let's not trash the boy just yet. Uh, then he ends up in a match. He ends up in Blood and Guts, which I didn't think he was very good. I think it was actually surprising at how bad he was. And here, I don't know, like he blew a spot. He didn't seem to know what he what was going on. He he didn't seem in position for anything. Seemed to step behind. It, it felt like he was a guy in the middle of a wrestling match. You know? Everything is happening around him. And he's just like, oh, I'll do a thing here. Juice and Jay White continue to be a highlight of AEW. And, and, and this pay-per-view reminded me how uh, useless JR is uh, on commentary now. Because in this match, he was confused. He was complaining about the ref. He was going, why is everything golden? Well, because it's the golden elite, JR. And you could tell Excalibur was super annoyed at this. Like, Are we really covering this here right now? Because I'm pretty sure everyone understands. Um, he doesn't like the product. He, he does not like the AEW product. I believe this is clear. And when he retires and he continues his podcast with, with Conrad, uh, he's eventually going to shoot on AEW. And he says, you know, saying, well, you know, I went to work, but I didn't like the product. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sitting here and going, ah, I knew it. But a really great match. Love the finish with Kenny V triggering the shit out of everyone until Takeshita rolls up Omega for the win. And I... Look, I told you guys that we, you know, this pay per view was going to be used to set up some stuff for All Out, and this is uh, this was one of these matches. There you go. AEW World Tag Team Titles were defended and successfully retained by FTR by defeating the Young Bucks. This was great again. This was good, great, but I was disappointed. If that makes sense, <laughs> does that make sense? Like, if you're like me, you immediately know what, I, what I'm talking about. But let me break this down a little more. It's like, I think, look, from the three matches that they've had, I think this was my least favorite of the three. And here I am saying this out of a match I thought was great. But I really thought this was the least compelling of, of their triumvirate of matches. I don't think it really ever hit that special spot, that sweet spot, that... That extra gear you need. Uh, I thought the you know the environment was perfect for it. You know the the eighty thousand people, the the excitement. I, this was a match that everyone had circled. I do believe, and that you know there's this weird segment, and I don't know how you know, between Matt and Dax, and they just seem un, they're doing suplexes on each other, and it seems uncooperative. It's a little clunky, and I don't know if that was by design. I like. And they do callbacks to their previous finishes of their matches. And I'm like, this is great. This is legitimately great because it leads to great near falls. The Shatter Machine puts the Jacksons away and I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because I thought that we were going to get something a lot more special. And I also thought the Bucks were going to win. And I still think they should have. I don't understand it. Okay, I keep saying it's we got to stop pretending. We have the Bucks need to have their dominant tag team run in this company. You know, we last week I was talking about it. And I was thinking that the Bucks, you know, on the on the Dynamite review, I was saying that the Bucks haven't got their big run. They haven't got their dominant run in AEW as tag team champions running through the entire division. And this caused a bit of a stir on the Discord where people said, well, their match with FTR was great. And then they had, you know, when they when they won the titles, that was great too against the Lucha Bros. Like one of the... And I know I'm alone on this island where Lucha Bros versus Young Bucks in the cage match at uh, in 2021... 
you know, everyone lose, lose, lost their shit around it. I was like, this is a fun spot fest, but this is not a match of the year for me. I think it's one of, I think it is a terribly overrated match. And I know I'm a lo- probably alone on this. That's fine. So, and th- and then you look at the rest of the of their uh, of their uh, tenure as champions: Jurassic Express, The Acclaim, Butcher and the Blade. And I'm and I'm not talking about the quality of the matches. People were like, well, Warren, the Butcher and the Blade match was really good. I'm not talking about the quality of the matches. I'm talking about a, a dominant, defining run where they are blowing through everyone. Not unlike what FTR is doing, slash done. And this is their company. This is the the company that they founded. The the Bucks are probably the greatest tag team of the past 20 years. And they are absolutely the tag team of the 2010s. And now they're on national TV competing in front of uh in front of fans everywhere every week. Yeah, I think their their legacy, since we talk about legacy so much when we're talking about FTR, the Bucks' legacy has to be uh, 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 solidified by a nationally viewed, dominant, destructive run where they just clean house. They just clean house on the entire tag team division. And we've got some great tag teams still here, right? We can go back to Lucha Bros. We can we can pull out uh, best friends if we want. But look, we got Ozzy open. We still got another match with FTR. We've got Jay and uh, and Juice that are coming up, looking great. We need like the Bucks need this, I find. And I'm not shitting on the quality of their matches that they had during their run. I know their matches were good. Don't get me wrong. But there's another level to this where it's like, who have they defeated? Who have they been facing? Have they been facing the top people in the company? Have they, or in wrestling at the very least? And I don't think we're getting that out of the Bucks. But look, again, a great match that I was into. Don't get me wrong. It's just like, it's not what I was expecting. I think this one underdelivered. But still a great match. Isn't it, aren't I weird? <laughs> does, does any of this make sense? So listen, we're going through this. You know, we're three matches in and we're getting palm, palm, palm. Just great matches. And then we fall into the stadium stampede match. And it's another great one. And it's another great one. And I'm sitting there and I'm at the end of this match. And I'm like, when are we going to have a come down? Is there something that's going to happen that's just going to destroy everything for me? But listen, listen, it didn't happen in this match, just chaos. I am thankful, thankful that this was not a pre-tape match, that it was Stadium Stampede in name only. This was closer to an anarchy in the arena than anything else. And we got the chaos. We got the juice. Orange Cassidy bled like a pig here. And I loved it because it's not something you see every day. That's what made it more shocking, more surprising. It's like, whoa. Cassidy running the razor on this one. And and honestly, listen, we're not talking enough about the career year of Orange Cassidy, a true-to-form, modern, top-tier, unquestionable, top-level uh, run. And you know, we, we can't, not enough people are talking about it. Quality of opponents, regular defenses, good to great matches every single time. Outstanding stuff by Cassidy here. Again, but throughout. Kingston comes out to a huge reaction from the crowd, like a tremendous reaction. And he just, he just beelined for Claudio and that was fantastic. Uh, listen, we get skewers and mocks his head. And then he eats a made in Japan by Penta. Well, he still has the skewers in his head. We get chaos and split screens. And listen, don't get me wrong here. Production wasn't great. This was not cinema. No, no, no. They're cutting away from action. Just as something is about to happen, we cut to 
you know, walk and brawling. We're about to see a spot, whoop, uh, over here where these guys are rolling around on the, like, what the fuck? Trent, in this match, like I'm talking about Orange Cassidy, you want to talk about someone, you want to talk about someone who ate complete shit in this match? <laughs> There's so much blood in this match. There's so much, there was so much more blood than in the actual blood and guts match. Penta at some point lands on his head and medics immediately run in to take carry him off. And I and I was like, oh shit, he's hurt. Because you know, you they, you know, they sort of cut away with the camera and it was kind of weird. And I was like, oh shit, not in it. But no, he came back as Penta Oscuro. And I'm like, okay. His dark form. The dark side of Penta Oscuro. And they had the entrance and everything. I'm like, all right. Okie dokie. Sue is there. They sacrificed cookies for the good of this match. Santana and Ortiz were all over the place too. They were great. Fit in well with the BCC here. Um, and then we, we get the visual of Eddie Kingston who'd been backstage fighting and he's stomping back down the down the, the, the ramp into the arena with a barbed wire chair and he and Mox get at it. Orange Cassidy. Uh, orange punches Claudio Castagnoli after dipping his hand, he putting duct tape around his hand and then putting it in some glass. It was sugar glass. You looked at it and said, like, oh, this is not real glass. But who cares? It does like it doesn't matter. Like I it it didn't destroy my appreciation of the match. And I know a lot of people bitched about that, but you know, Anakin, um, in the discord made a good point it's like look we believe you know we're here and we believe we, we we can we can accept the undertaker being you know an undead zombie but we're gonna get pissed off because a guy decided you know put sugar glass instead of real glass around his fist for all right i agree yeah and i agree but i thought this was great the chaos the craziness there's stuff happening everywhere in this match i only wish production was able to keep up with it with the big spots i don't know why people didn't like this i feel like there's a contingent of people who really were like oh this is but the this is chaos and it felt like again this reminds me of old ecw matches where you'd have guys fighting at two different places in the arena and the cameras were trying to keep up and it was just chaos and I love that energy. I think it. I, this worked for me. And we had the AEW World t uh, Women's World Title match where Soraya defeated Hikaru Shida, Britt Baker, and Tony Storm to become the new champion in a match that I thought over delivered, where my expectations were not very high. And here I am, and I'm going fantastic. I thought this over delivered. I loved it. Soraya comes out with all of her family. Cage match is really rough on this match here. 4.88 out of 10, which I think I know why. Because the, the folks on cage match, they don't like Brit and they don't like Soraya. They really hate them, actually. And look, this is a Brit Baker podcast. It always will be. I don't think that 4.88 is a complete travesty. I don't think it's a, I, I think that's way too low, ridiculously low. But anyway, we get dissension in this match between the outcasts to the point that Ruby has to come in. She gets clocked. Soraya has Tony Storm. This is my favorite part, spot of the, uh, of the match. Tony Storm has, uh, Soraya has Tony Storm in the uh, Scorpion cross lock, but Britt stomps her while she's hanging there in the move, which was a fantastic spot. And uh, Soraya spray paints Tony Storm in the face, lands the nightcap on Tony for the win. So, clearly we're not done with this story here. But, of course, Soraya gets the nice moment. I think this was inevitable. But the question that I have for you is, what's next? What do we do with Soraya moving forward? I don't think Soraya is a particularly good professional wrestler. 
I don't know what her value is all that much in the company. I am completely behind moments and stuff like that. But then what happens after the moment is equally important. And I don't see what's so compelling about world champion Soraya here. Maybe we'll get some, some sort of something put together that will put all of this at ease and I'll be like, ah, oh, Warren, you silly goose. This is what they were doing all along. But like for the, for the foreseeable future, this is not my choice. But for the moment, for letting Saraya get a big win, I absolutely get it. And it's a smart thing to do. But another great, you know, another great match here. And we get another one with the coffin match. Another one. Like, I'm telling you, I'm watching this. I'm like, this, all of this rules. This is great. With Darby pulling off some great moves in this match while his hands are tied, literally taped behind his back. Right? Uh, and Sting diving off an apron through the table and the table not breaking. Darby takes this sick coffin drop bump off the top of the um, the the top of the coffin that's closed and just whiplashes off of it it's just sick bump Luchasaurus interferes so does Nick Wayne the coffin finally makes it into the ring Sting, Sting no sells a chair shot but eats a bat to the no nose courtesy of Christian Cage swerves 450 on Sting um, uh, who was laying on the coffin does not work out which leads to Sting locking in a scorpion death drop into the coffin for the win. Goes Swerve. This was creative and very, very creative and full, fun of, full of really fun bumps. This delivered. This super delivered. And folks, I don't know if you took the time to watch these entrances. Swerve Strickland is a star and I've been, I have been hammering this home this is a constant topic here on the mr warren hayes show but i have to mention it especially with the adk people in the stadium with he is a star and he has everything you need out of a big time star you can't hold this guy back any longer and you have to stop fucking around with these stables. You know, look, getting him out of the trench and Parker Boudreaux bullshit was a good idea. But the AR Fox stuff, I still don't understand why we had to kill that angle. I really don't. Because that worked for him. Everything was... We can't fuck around with this too long. Swerve is amazing. And this guy has to be earmarked for a world title run. Will Ospreay defeated Chris Jericho. Hey, remember there were a bunch of people who were talking about booking Will Ospreay at uh, at Wembley, and people would say, "Ah, oh, no one's going to know who this uh, Will Ospreay is." You remember that? And yet this place became unglued when he came out. Anyway, you know what? Let me tell you about this match. Another great one. Another great one. We get ourselves a sky twister from Osprey like two minutes into the match. It's already living up to my expectations. Jericho lands a huge German suplex on the apron. This is a tremendous spot. And Jericho, he's got his working boots on for this match, right? He's hitting double code breakers and running into Spanish flies. Sure, okay. There's some sloppy spots here, like when he tries to interrupt an os cutter. It doesn't quite work out. But... It's a, like everything worked here. He kicks out of a Stormbreaker. Osprey hits a Hidden Blade and a second Oss Cutter for the win. Just a fantastic match where Jericho worked Osprey's pace. Two great storytellers who aren't afraid to get physical. Jericho loses again, teases a fight with Sammy. But listen, I, Jericho loses again. Puts the other guy over. I do not understand... Why people are so against Chris Jericho. We've talked about. You can you can get 
offended by his political inclinations, what he talks about. I don't know. Like, I can understand that. But when it comes to his work and what he does for this company, this guy has spent all of his time putting people over. And I was saying, coming into this, Jericho needs some heat back. And he's still not doing it. He still put Osprey over. He put Osprey over in a year, like Will Osprey told us on Dynamite last week, in a year, in just a couple of months, where Will Osprey will have defeated Kenny Omega, Kazuchika Okada, and Chris Jericho, all within a two-month span. Don't think Jericho knows what he's doing. That this is not that this is not clear. Jericho puts people over. Now, if the people don't stay over, I fail to see how that's Chris Jericho's fault. It could be the person's fault itself, or it could be booking. It could be creative. It could be Tony Khan's fault. But there are more people who have benefited from working television with Chris Jericho than anyone else. And if you don't think there are tons of guys in the backstage lining up to get on TV with Chris Jericho, because if you're in a feud with Chris Jericho, you are on TV every single week. You don't think there are people begging to work with Chris Jericho? You're out of your mind. And Osprey in this circle. Look, if Tony Khan is trying to woo Will Osprey once his New Japan contract comes out, comes up, if he's not trying to woo him over by having him, you know, be on the, the, the Big Forbidden Door show and go over Kenny Omega, one of the AEW's top stars, and then come to the big Wembley show and have his Wembley moment in front of 81,000 people and defeat Chris Jericho? Like, if he hasn't already agreed, I'm not saying signed, but I'm saying agreed. If he hasn't already agreed, Jesus Christ, we're this close, right? I think Will Ospreay in AEW is all but inevitable at this point. But another great match. Another great match. And then we had, then we had my come down. The match I least enjoyed of the card, the trios match, Billy Gunn and the Acclaim, uh, winning the AEW World Trios title from the House of Black. I thought this was my, this absolutely was my least favorite match. And I don't, honestly, with all the time I spent talking about CM Punk and the main event and, and the card, I don't, there's, there's no major thoughts here. I thought it was a little sloppy. Bones gets the pin on Black. Billy Gunn gets his nice moment. I'm, it's fine. It all makes sense. It's all tied together. It's all right. It's cool. Um, but I really don't have many thoughts on this. I really don't. Nice little tribute to Bray Wyatt. I don't know what you want from me. I this this absolutely was the down point of the show. Worst match of the of the show. Now you may be wondering. You'd be saying, Warren, what's your what's your match of the show? What's your match of the night? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I th maybe. Maybe Osprey Jericho? Maybe the Bullet Club Elite match? I don't know. Because here's the thing. This is how we're going to wrap this up. This was a tremendous show, but there's not, for me, there was not a single match of the year candidate on this mat, on this show. Nothing that, you know, just blows your mind and goes, this is one of the greatest things. This is fantastic. I, there's there's not a, a single match for me that reached that level. There were fantastic, great matches all around, except for two. Great matches all around. I was, I thoroughly enjoyed the show, but nothing, nothing stood out specifically. You know when you watch a good television show and it's an ensemble cast, and everyone is just pulling their own weight. And there's no one who's like a, like a breakout star. It's just like everyone is just so fucking good from top to bottom. This is how this... This is a, a, a comparison. And don't see it as a bad thing. 
I think it's a good thing. There's nothing I'm sitting here raving about how great it was. I just sat here raving about something how some how awful one thing was on this show. But you know, here's the thing. On the day before, I was watching the Rev Pro 11th anniversary ma- uh, show. And on that show, and you know, in lieu of giving you a recommendation or a match of the year candidate for uh for all in, I'll give you one from the Rev Pro show that had me sitting there that had me sitting there looking at it slack jawed popping out of my seat looking at something where I'm like this is pro wrestling this is exactly what I love from pro wrestling two guys beating each other up going through going through a war and attrition making me believe making sucking me into the drama Tomohiro Ishii versus Luke Jacobs outstanding stuff match of the year stuff and I I watched this and I popped into the Mr. Warren Hayes show discord and I typed in this is the match of the weekend and I said it I said I don't see anything on all in the next day that could top that and nothing did this was phenomenal and you should go out of your way to watch it. And in fact, the Rev Pro show was amazing as well. I'll probably talk about it on Going Broadway maybe this week if you want to come join me for that. But Luke Jacobs and 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 Tomohiro Ishii, just compelling, outstanding, dramatic, hard hitting. Like if you like pro wrestling, do you like pro wrestling? You owe it to yourself to watch this match. Trust me. And it's not its not something that is super complex. It's not something that requires layers of understanding or, you know, that has great technical ability. It has great ability. It has fantastic stuff. But this is all so refreshingly elementary, yet so outstanding. Taking, like when you take this, when you're cooking and you take the simplest ingredients to make something great. This is essentially what it was. That's something I will outright recommend to you. And now, it's enough talk about All In and and AEW. I feel like like we may have uh, spent a few moments, uh, quite a few moments talking about AEW tonight. Let's go over to the world of World Wrestling Entertainment because this weekend we've got ourselves a premium live event called Payback 2023. Uh, It is happening on September 2nd from the PPG Paints Arena at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's a lot of alliteration right there. PPB Paints. (laughs) Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. (laughs) Um, so we have this show of course I'm going to watch it like I said I always watch the big shows Uh, this is uh, what we have lined up here for the big big show Uh, we are going to have Becky Lynch versus Trish Stratus in a steel cage match Um, I don't know who is pushing for more Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus but every time they have shared a ring, it has been bad. That match, you remember the con- the controversy around Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus being kept off of SummerSlam. Remember that? And then two weeks later, they do it on Raw. I watched that match because I was like, look, I want to take a look and see this match that People lost their shit over that should have been on SummerSlam, right? Had to be on SummerSlam. Okay, let's see what they do here. And that match stunk, okay? And I'm not trying to do a bit here. This was a bad pro wrestling match. And I I have two thoughts about it. Thought number one, uh, stop letting Trish wrestle. Number two, 
Becky Lynch, at this point of her career, should be able to carry people to match to good matches, but she can't. So, are we doing the cage match to mask some things so that we can do some some terrible WWE plunder? Don't get me wrong, the plunder in WWE is it, it's terrible. Are we trying to mask some Trish, Trish issues here? I don't know what this is going to be. Look, I don't know. I'm not excited for this. And I love Becky Lynch. I don't know what to tell you. Seth freaking Rollins will be defending the World Heavyweight Championship against Shinsuke Nakamura. This will entirely depend on how motivated Shinsuke will be and uh, as to whether this will be good or not. Uh, because the last time that Shinsuke, the last few times that Shinsuke would compete for world championships in WWE, they were very, very tepid affairs. So, I, you know, will Seth be able to drag something out of him? I don't know. I like Seth. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I'm sure there's a whole story around this, but I don't really care. Um, I'm excited to see this match. Shinsuke versus Seth. But if, if Nakamura is ready to phone it in, this is going to be a slog, folks. Rhea Ripley will be defending the Women's World Championship against Raquel Rodriguez. I remember when Raquel Rodriguez, when she was uh, in NXT, and before she, you know, way, way, way back in the black and gold era when she was in a tag team with Rhea Ripley, and Raquel was in, uh, she was in Chaps, she she carried um, she carried a uh, a bullwhip around Raquel Rodriguez. She was badass, a hell of a team. Rhea right now is the most unheralded star in this entire company, and um, I've seen commentary you know from people online saying. Oh, Rhea should not be squashing people. She needs to be, you know, wrestling high profile. Wait, they're finally building a champion in this company who's going out there just wrecking face, destroying people, establishing themselves as a threat, and we're going to complain? So that when Raquel comes into this, they're like, oh, well, okay, Raquel's a name. Maybe she'll have a chance. I don't know, because... Rhea's been destroying everyone. I think this is fine. This is great booking, actually. And people are going to find ways to complain about it when they finally have a dominant champion and someone in the, in the women's division, which is so dire right now, terribly dire, I don't know how this match is going to go because look, I love Rhea. I think Raquel is hit or, hit or miss. I think, I, you know, I don't think Raquel is that great a worker, whereas I think Rhea is. And Rhea has the charisma. She has the star presence. Rhea is, you know, miles above Raquel in, 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 in so many ways. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Rey Mysterio is going to be taking on Austin Theory. Um, this is a rematch for the U.S. title. Um, I'll probably give it back to Theory. Like, who cares? Who cares? Like, I, you know, Rey Mysterio 2023 is so weird to me. And Austin Theory is... Austin Theory. You know, I know. I say it every time when we talk about Austin Theory. But, you know, I, everyone says, you know, well, Austin Theory, he's going to be... Um, he's going to be... Uh, uh, a big star someday. It's like, as long as WWE decides to make him a big star and decides to push him, whoever they decide to push, regardless, is going to be a big star. That's the thing. Whether you like him or not, whether you think someone else should get it or not, because I don't see the special qualities that make Austin Theory the next John Cena, the next big deal. I don't see them. I think he's a very average pro wrestler. He's got 
acceptable charisma. He's not a dud, you know. But he doesn't have superstar qualities. Superstar in the Oxford Dictionary sense of the word, not WWE superstar definition. I don't see it. I really don't. LA Knight is taking on The Miz. Do you think they're going to do the Spider-Man point meme? Because to me, I look at this and I'm like, well, this is, this is the same guy. It's, it's essentially the same guy. This has the potential to be a terrific train wreck. Because these are both average-ass wrestlers. And LA Knight is going to win. Or at least he should. He should. But you got to get the heat, pal. Never forget that. And WWE is great at this. And I am convinced the internet is going to have a meltdown. WWE fans are going to have a meltdown if LA Knight loses. And I think there's a fair chance he will. Because again, look, I just told you, whoever they decide to push is going to be the guy. And they have plans. They have plans set up. LA Knight is not part of the plan. He was not supposed to get himself over, which is why they had him lose his big matches. Had him win the Slim Jim Battle Royal. Who cares? And then puts him in a feud with The Miz. The Miz can absolutely win this. I can absolutely see WWE going, nope. The Miz, he's our guy. He's the he's the heel. He's gonna get the heat, brother. Because they want to contain this LA Knight stuff. Don't think that they're going backstage, rubbing their hands together, and just like, oh shit, LA Knight, let's go. No, 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 no. This is LA Knight is getting too much attention. They're gonna try and contain this. If he shines too brightly, he's gonna be another Zack Ryder. The thing here. It's that I think LA Knight is a very average pro wrestler, just like The Miz. You know, I know everyone is like comparing him to Austin and The Rock and all that. Austin and Rock in their prime, fantastic workers, both of them in their styles. Brawlers, you know, but just super compelling, super, super compelling workers, which I don't think Eli Drake is. I don't think he ever was. The Miz isn't. Look. This, this is the one that people will be excited for because it's LA Knight and he's over with WWE fans. But this also has the potential to be a tremendous train wreck. And I don't think it finishes clean. I think there's all sorts of garbage that's going to happen here. And then in the main event, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn will be defending the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship against Finn Balor and Damian Priest of the Judgment Day who are still having their own little bloodline feud over the... You'll notice no bloodline on this show at all. Completely devoid of the the the, the tribal chief and his minions and his ooses. That's not very oosy of WWE. Um, and they're having their own little thing with the, with the briefcase, right? Look, Remember when I was talking about the main event of All In and I was telling you MJF throwing the title says this doesn't matter so on and so forth, you know, you know, and we're like and, and, and I'm warning and, you know, I set up a big warning telling you be careful, folks, because the minute we start making stories more important than titles, than the titles, then it, then we get into the well, what's the story of this match? And then just fighting for titles don't matter anymore. This is it here. The, the, the tag team championships, and this is a no DQ, by the way. It's a Steel City street fight. This, the, this match here, the tag team titles are props. They're props. They don't matter here because you know what matters? Finn Balor and Damian Priest. Now, I'm going to invite you to watch this match and see just how much um, and see just how much um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, 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 how, how similar a structure we're going to get in this match versus Roman matches in his main events where there's ref bumps and interferences and because I think this is going to be one of these circumstances where people are going to, where everyone, every WWE fan is going to be like, 
what's going to happen to Damian Priest and Finn Balor because they're feuding over this, you know, the 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 money in the bank stuff. They're not getting along. How is this going to work out? Whoops, is Dom, you know, how are Dom and Rhea going to react? You know, all of this superfluous stuff when we could just be getting the match. So this is what I'm telling you. This is what I'm warning. This is the flag that I've put up when I was talking about the all-in main event at, the, at early on in the show. You got the perfect example here. It's not about the titles here. It, it has nothing to do with the titles. Just... It's Judgment Day story. It's Bloodline Junior. It's Bloodline Part de. It's what it is. So, Kevin and Sammy will probably retain because the, the Bloodline are going to do stupid ass shit. You know, Finn is going to do something to, to Damian Priest and Priest is going to get accidentally covered. And, you know, so, you know that this kind of bullshit, this is what's going to happen. Interference, nonsense. It's, I'm already. I'm already anticipating this. Have you ever seen a WWE B-show scream B-show louder than this show does? This is tremendously B-show. This is the B-showiest of B-shows. Roman's not on this. Cody's not on this. Brock, well, we know Brock. You know, um... Yo, Bianca's not on this. Gunter's not on this. This feels like a B show. Looks and feels like a B show. We'll see what happens. But, uh, look, Roman must be really hurt, I guess. I guess if there, we're not doing we're not doing bloodline community. Thank goodness we had the we had the Judgment Day community theater stuff lingering beneath. We can we can default to that in the meantime. Uh, but I will be watching this this weekend, and I will have a full review next week here in the Mr. Warren Hay Show. And if you feel like it in the Mr. Warren Hay Show Discord, I know I keep asking y'all to join because it's a good time and it's fun but we are having wwe payback pickums uh predictions in the uh in the discord we'll be starting them tomorrow wednesday so by the time you're listening to this maybe they'll have started uh but come join the discord there'll be a prize there'll be a prize at the end uh a ten dollar gift certificate at p pro wrestling tees.com will be waiting for you for the winner i should say uh of uh, of the pickums so uh come on in come join us it'll be exciting uh, and next week I'm going to break all of this down and uh, hopefully hopefully it'll be good at the very least cross our fingers let's wrap this up uh, we're going to do an, a preview of all in 2023 which uh, of course is happening at the United Center in Chicago, Illinois, this weekend, September, September 3rd, um, G. Willikers, <laughs> will CM Punk be there? Oh my Lord. Maybe by the time we're listening, you're listening to this, maybe this has all been worked out and, you know, everyone is best of friends again. Maybe this whole podcast was for not. I don't think so though. But, uh, look, this is where we're at right now. We have the, we have the pay-per-view happening this weekend and, uh, we only have, as it stands right now, five matches officially announced for the card. We do not know what's happening with the world championship at this point. So, you know, again, you'll probably be listening to this on the Wednesday. Dynamite is going to happen. So I'm not going to try and harp on this too much. We're going to sort of blow through all of this because uh, I'm also going over time here. Uh, Luchasaurus will be taking on Darby Allen for the AEW TNT championship. This is the first match that had been set for months at this point. Um, I think Darby Allen pick gets the title back. I really do. Uh, I think Darby has, you know, I was talking about this during the during the pillar feud. You remember that? 
Uh, I was talking about this during the Pillar feud where I thought Darby was the the one out of the 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 three other pillars who isn't MJF uh, who came across looking the best out of Sammy, out of Jack. He's the one who I feel translated the best. And I think this feud that he's been having with Swerve has been fantastic, much more compelling than the Luchasaurus Christian Cage stuff. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what kind of match we're going to get out of this, but uh, Darby's going to get thrown around a lot and he's going to have a comeback spot and he's going to, and he's going to win. So there you go. That's my that's my official prediction. Miro will be taking on Powerhouse Hobbs. They had a contract signing on the Zero Hour. I'm glad I missed that. Because the Zero Hour apparently was two hours. But I had never heard that it was two hours. And I double-checked all sorts of stuff. Nobody, nobody knew it was two hours. So they did a contract signing there. I'm excited to see this. Who doesn't want to see just two guys just, you know, just lay into each other? Just two beefy men doing beefy men things. Be great. Chris Statlander will be uh, defending the AEW TBS Championship against Ruby Soho. That came out of nowhere. I would have thought they would have ran Mercedes Martinez. I don't understand that. But, uh... Uh, these two know each other very well, so I guess this will be... I have no issues here. It should be fine. Orange Cassidy or Penta El Zero Miedo uh, will be taking on John Moxley because Orange Cassidy and Penta, I think, are having a match this week on Dynamite, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. They will. And... Um, and the winner of that is going to face John Moxley. It will most assuredly be Orange Cassidy. This is a match I am super excited for. This is a big time match for Cassidy in this stellar year of his against Mox, who always has banner years. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, just great stuff there. And Kineske Takesha versus Kenny Omega, which has been building for a long time. And this should tear the house down. I My expectations are high for this match, and I think they should. Kind of like FTR and the Bucks. I think it's okay. And I think both of these guys are going to focus, and they're going to deliver a, tr a terrific top match here. I don't know if CM Punk is going to be on it. I think they run MJF and Adam Cole again. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully if they do, we get a match, and we get a true story bump. But I don't think so. I think we're going to continue this, the festival of friendship. Which again, is fine. As long as I get great matches. As long as I get good matches, I'm happy. There you go. That's where we're at. That's the thing. I know it's a quick preview, but I've kept you guys here long enough. Let's just wrap this up with the weekly wrestling inspection. <laughs> You, you don't have to worry about about the all out, the all out thing. Even you know, if I'm, I don't want to come across as dismissive. It's just I don't know how to approach this. I feel like we're in new territory when it comes to, you know, the the uh, two pay per views back to back within the same company. Like I don't know how to how to position myself, how to react exactly. I'm gonna have a good proper re review next week. So next week, you already know on the docket. We're reviewing All Out. We're reviewing Payback. Should be a lot of fun. I'm excited for it already. I'm excited for this pay-per-views for next week too. And I'm also excited to welcome you back here for another live recording of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show. Every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern on YouTube.com slash Mr. Warren Hayes is where the magic happens. I'd love to have you. If you can ever pop in to join us on a live recording, do so. It's a lot of fun. We have a good time. We'd love to have you. Uh, otherwise, hey, listen... I'll be back on, on Thursday for uh, the Dynamite review. I'll be back on Sunday for the Collision review. Yes, I'm going to sneak in a Collision review before we get to Dynamite. I think there's there's it's probably going to be very eventful shit. 
Let's just leave it at that. Um, join the Mr. Warren Hayes Discord. The link is in the description. Uh, I thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for listening on your favorite podcast application as well. If you're listening right now, please leave a five star rating on uh, a five star rating on Spotify and a five star review on Apple Podcasts. I would appreciate it a great deal. I'll be back. I'll be back soon. Thank you all so very much. Have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you next time.